Bellatrix Lestrange's descent into madness can be attributed to a combination of her inherent, unpleasant, and bigoted nature, her deep involvement in the dark arts, and her fanatical allegiance to Voldemort. The 14 years she spent in Azkaban further exacerbated her mental state. It's worth noting that she never received the Dementor's kiss, a fate that might have left her as a vegetable, but instead she endured Voldemort's kiss if we consider the cursed child as canon. I personally don't, but they are too arguments about that to fill narrative gaps in the original series. The absence of Bellatrix during the Battle of the Tower in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince raises questions. The play addresses this gap by suggesting that she may have been pregnant. Moreover, the emphasis on family trees in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows becomes significant. Voldemort's obsession with blood purity and lineage is well established. Voldemort's reaction to Tonks' marriage showcases his disdain for any perceived dilution of purity pure bloodlines. Speaking of which, the Black family's practice of inbreeding may have contributed to genetic predispositions that affected Bellatrix's mental health. However, it's essential to note that not all members of the Black family exhibited the same level of instability. Interestingly, individuals like Narcissa and Andromeda, who also share the family's bloodline, did not succumb to madness. Bellatrix married Rodolphus, and they do not have children ruling out bloodline preservation as a motive. Arranged marriages are not mentioned in the books, so it's unlikely they were forced into marriage. Her imprisonment in Azkaban during what could have been her best childbearing years hindered any plans for starting a family. If she was willing to have kids, this fact could let her devastated in her lonely years in Azkaban, where the Dementors reminded her of her worst moments. Bellatrix Lestrange was born around 19 1951. This estimation is based on the fact that she is portrayed as the oldest of her sisters on the Black family tree, and it is alluded that both Narcissa and Lucius Malfoy, who were a few years ahead of Severus Snape, were born around 1954 and 1955, respectively. Since Bellatrix is the eldest, she may be born around 1951. Snape, who was at least 30 years old in the first book, provides a range for Bellatrix's potential age at the time of her death. The conclusion drawn is that she likely died around 46, 51 years old, which seems past childbearing years. However, witches might have an extended childbearing period, considering the longer lifespan of wizards. Bellatrix may have planned to have children after winning the war, given the challenging circumstances upon her release from Azkaban. The reasons for Bellatrix's marriage remain speculative, with factors like her mental state and the broader wizarding context. Maybe Bellatrix did not have kids in the book canon because of the consequences of generations of a limited pool of mates among pure-blood wizarding families. Inbreeding within such families may lead to infertility issues as seen in other communities like the Kingston Group of Fundamentalist Mormons, where documented genetic abnormalities are prevalent. This suggests that some pure-blood couples, after numerous generations of intermarriage, could face difficulties conceiving. We can draw comparisons to characters like Merope Gaunt, who may have experienced medical issues due to inbreeding. Do pure-blood wizards trust conventional medical medical practitioners, or do they rely on magical means to address health concerns? There is ambiguity surrounding the use of magical healing for certain conditions, such as strabismus, and about the limitations of magical solutions, or whether they can extend to cosmetic issues like teeth straightening or weight management. Even though it would be difficult to find volunteers for eyesight experimentation, which could be a potential reason why certain magical conditions, such as eyesight issues, are not readily addressed in the wizarding world. World. The idea of limited genetics and potential medical neglect within pure blood families is reinforced by examples like Marop Gaunt's father and brother, who exhibit eccentric behavior, maybe from inbreeding in their lineage. Coming back to Bellatrix, let's dive into every moment of the series she appears that deserve more analysis. Time at Hogwarts Bellatrix Lestrange, during her time as a student at Hogwarts, could be envisioned as a highly talented and powerful witch, similar to Hermione Granger, but with a much more prideful and prejudiced personality. It is suggested that she excelled in classes, particularly in wand work, showcasing prodigious magical skill. However, her deference to the authority of teachers might be questionable, and her personality is likened to a fusion of Draco Malfoy and Hermione. She is described as essentially an evil version of 
of Hermione, emphasizing her intelligence and proficiency in spells. She may have been insufferably arrogant, elitist, and associated with the bad crowd. She is among the most powerful magic users, comparable to Moody and Kingsley. She might have overlapped with characters like Arthur and Molly Weasley, but she likely associated with other pure blood students, possibly proto Death Eaters. Additionally, she might have been unhinged even during the First War, especially after engaging in torturous acts, but I like the fact that the jail time actually emphasizes her madness. The arrest. The Death Eaters, including Bellatrix, the Lestrange brothers, and Barty Crouch Jr., did not immediately go after Harry Potter for several reasons. Firstly, Bellatrix was certain that Voldemort, their master, wasn't truly gone after his disappearance following the incident with Harry. In their pursuit to find Voldemort, they focused on other members of the Order of the Phoenix, particularly Alice and Frank Longbottom, to extract information on Voldemort's whereabouts. The Death Eaters used the Cruciatus Curse on the Longbottom but failed to obtain any useful information. Frustrated and desperate, Bellatrix subjected the Longbottoms to further torture, resulting in the loss of their minds and any memory of their newborn son, Neville. This brutal act, however, didn't lead them to Harry. Several reasons explain why they didn't go after Harry immediately. Firstly, the idea that a mere baby could defeat the most powerful dark wizard in the world was unheard of, and the concept of Lily's sacrificial protection was likely foreign and unbelievable to the Death Eaters. They probably thought Voldemort had been captured before reaching Harry, and the story of the rebounded curse was a ruse to keep them from attempting a rescue. Moreover, Harry was under the magical protection of his muggle relatives, the Dursleys and the Death Eaters couldn't find him. The Death Eaters, who looked down on muggles, never considered that a baby who played a role in their master's downfall would be given to the care of muggles. Additionally, Harry, being a baby, couldn't provide them with information about Voldemort, which was their primary objective at that time. As time passed and they realized the truth about the rebounded curse, Harry was already under the protection of powerful magical wards at the Dursleys. The Death Eaters were also actively being tracked down and arrested, further hindering any plans of revenge. The Lestranges, including Bellatrix, Rodolphus, and Rabastan, were initially pronounced innocent after going to trial for their alleged involvement as Death Eaters. This revelation comes from Sirius Black in the the fourth book, Goblet of Fire, where he mentions that Crouch's son was caught with a group of Death Eaters who managed to talk their way out of Azkaban, attempting to bring Voldemort back to power. The specifics of the trial seen in the Pensieve were focused on a particular crime, not their general association with Death Eaters. The jury in that trial might have felt a sense of disbelief or regret, realizing they had let these individuals go free, only for them to later capture and torture auras when the Wizarding World believed believed they were finally safe. The Lestrange's ability to deny their loyalty to Voldemort during the first trial allowed them to evade Azkaban and continue their pursuit of the Dark Lord. In the fourth book of the Harry Potter series, Sirius Black explains his escape from Azkaban, detailing how he transformed into a dog to sneak past the guards and swim to shore. He also sheds light on the challenge of maintaining his sanity during the escape. However, when it comes to the mass breakout involving the Lestranges and others, there's no explicit indication in the books about the specific methods they used to escape Azkaban. Voldemort might have had control over the Dementors at that time, allowing the mass breakout to occur. This theory aligns with the different reaction of the Ministry, particularly Cornelius Fudge, to this escape compared to Sirius Black's earlier breakout. Should have stationed human guards at Azkaban, or were the Dementors alone deemed sufficient? Human guards like Auras could have provided an additional layer of security, but it's a potential waste of manpower given the effectiveness of Dementors in driving prisoners to madness. Voldemort and the Dementors could have easily taken care of them. After her escape, Bellatrix would likely react to the revelation that Voldemort Voldemort was half-blood by convincing herself that the pure blood in him had somehow overcome the impurities. The Death Eaters, including Bellatrix, were not immune to hypocrisy in their beliefs about blood purity. The idea is that they prioritized power and their perceived superiority over strict adherence to their supposed ideals of pure blood supremacy. Bellatrix and other Death Eaters were probably aware of Voldemort's half-blood status, but didn't care. The focus was on serving him 
for the power and privilege it brought rather than the purity of blood. The caste system of blood purity might have allowed for some flexibility as long as individuals were not at the bottom of the hierarchy. Pure blood ideology was more of a tool for the Death Eaters to attain power rather than a deeply held belief. Maybe Voldemort was considered expendable at the beginning of his rise, before he made everyone bend the knee. After the Ministry, in the aftermath of the Department of Mysteries incident, it seems that Voldemort did not directly punish Bellatrix for the failure. Voldemort blamed Lucius Malfoy more for the failure since he was supposed to be leading the group during that mission. Lucius held the command and bore the brunt of the responsibility for the mission's failure. Bellatrix, on the other hand, did not face direct punishment from Voldemort. Additionally, Voldemort might have indirectly punished Bellatrix by withholding information and secrets from her as well as showing a preference for Severus Snape. This is supported by a passage from the Half-Blood Prince where Bellatrix confronts Snape about not sharing information with her after the Ministry fiasco. Snape's response and Bellatrix's reaction indicate a strain in their relationship, possibly due to her perceived failure in the Department of Mysteries. Furthermore, there's an insightful observation that Bellatrix's claim of being entrusted with Voldemort's most precious might be a reference to her role in storing Hufflepuff's cup in her vault at Gringotts. But why Bellatrix lived with the Malfoys? One possible explanation is that she may not have had a home of her own after serving time in Azkaban. There is the possibility that her home may have been seized by the Ministry, similar to Sirius Black's situation, or that she simply preferred to stay at Malfoy Manor, which served as Voldemort's headquarters. Anyway, there is a lack of information about Bellatrix's personal residence. The fate of the Lestrange Gringotts vault is known, emphasizing the protection of wizarding assets by goblins. Dumbledore is testing if Creature belonged to Harry, so it shows the potential risks of inheritance and ownership in the wizarding world. Different branches of the Black family may have different residences. Anyway, Rodolphus Lestrange is the most forgotten character in the series the Malfoy Manor. If Bellatrix had kept Ron in the room while torturing Hermione, there's a strong argument that Ron might have been emotionally compelled to reveal information about the Horcruxes to stop Hermione's suffering. The intense emotional bond between Ron and Hermione, as portrayed in the books, suggests that Ron could have been more vulnerable to breaking under the pressure of witnessing Hermione's torture. However, Bellatrix might not have been interested in information about the Horcruxes. Ron revealing that they hadn't been into her vault and knew nothing about the Horcruxes might not have had a significant impact on the overall outcome. The potential revelation about the fake sword in Bellatrix's vault could have raised questions about Snape's loyalty, but it's uncertain if this information would have altered the course of events significantly. Additionally, Bellatrix's character is portrayed as fanatically loyal to Voldemort, and her understanding of compassion or affection is limited. Bellatrix might not have considered using Ron to extract information in the same way as she lacked the empathy to exploit emotional connections. The Death of Bellatrix The defeat of Bellatrix by Mrs. Weasley, despite her victories over Tonks, Sirius, and Kingsley, can be attributed to a combination of factors. First, Bellatrix's tendency to play and taunt her opponents before killing them might have led her to underestimate Mrs. Weasley. She viewed Molly as a weak, fragile mother, unaware of the powerful maternal love that Molly possessed. Maternal love is emphasized as the most potent form of love in the Harry Potter series. Molly, having witnessed the death of Fred and believing Harry to be dead, along with the imminent danger to her other children, Luna and Hermione tapped into a deep, unflinching level of love, devotion, and sacrifice. This maternal instinct triggered her transformation into a mama bear mode, exemplified by her battle cry, you will never touch our children again. The Death Eaters, including Bellatrix, failed to comprehend this level of love, giving Molly a unique and powerful advantage. Furthermore, Molly's strength in the duel is connected to her worst fear, as revealed when she couldn't handle a bogart showing her children's and Harry's dead bodies. The nightmare scenario becoming a reality fueled her rage and fear, adding substantial power to her spells. There is a misconception that Mrs. Weasley might be perceived as a less qualified wizard. Molly is not only a protective mother, but also a fully qualified and capable wizard, emphasizing that looks can be deceiving in the magical world. The series has established that magical prowess can be hidden behind 
behind appearances, as seen in various instances, such as the defeat of Voldemort by a toddler. Narcissa saved Harry's life because she prioritized saving her son Draco over anything else. This theme resonates with Confucius's argument about women prioritizing their children before the state, traditions, or values. Parental love knows no gender boundaries. Fathers express their commitment to protecting their children before all else. The emotional intensity of parental love is a universal experience. The protective instinct becomes heightened in parents. A possible theory for Molly beating Bellatrix could be rooted in the protective enchantment that Harry's sacrifice created for the defenders of Hogwarts. Harry's self-sacrifice in the forest generated a magical shield that seemed to ward off spells from the Death Eaters during the final battle. This protection extended to everyone within Hogwarts, not just against Voldemort, but against all dark magic. There are specific lines from the books where Harry explains to Voldemort that his sacrifice was intended to save others, creating a magical shield akin to the one his mother provided him with through her sacrifice. This shield was so powerful that it prevented spells from binding and harming the defenders of Hogwarts. Therefore, it is suggested that Molly, like other defenders, may have benefited from this magical protection, making her successful in defeating Bellatrix during the intense battle. The little sister of Fabian and Gideon Pruett, killed by Death Eaters, employed a spell that is not explicitly named in the text. However, the prevailing interpretation among fans is that Molly used a deadly curse, possibly the killing curse, Avada Kedavra. The rationale behind this speculation is rooted in the aftermath of the spell, which resulted in Bellatrix's demise. The killing curse is renowned for its lethal impact, and Molly's declaration, you will never touch our children again, adds a finality to the act, reinforcing the notion that a fatal curse was likely used. The use of unforgivable curses by the protagonists, as observed in Harry's employment of Crucio in Order of the Phoenix, and the application of Imperio to access Bellatrix's vault serves as subtle foreshadowing. This deviation from their usual ethical standards underscores the severity of the threat posed by Bellatrix and the Death Eaters. Considering the intense and close relationship between Voldemort and Bellatrix Lestrange, it can be inferred that Voldemort would have strong emotions upon her death. In the books, when Bellatrix dies during the Battle of Hogwarts, it is a significant moment. The phrase, Voldemort screamed, suggests that he might have experienced a combination of rage, grief, and frustration. Bellatrix was one of his most loyal and devoted followers, and her death could be seen as a blow to Voldemort's forces and a personal loss for him. It's plausible that Voldemort's reaction could be more complex than just anger. There might be an element of mourning or a realization of the setbacks his side is facing. The intensity of his emotions may be heightened by the broader context of the ongoing battle and the resurgence of Harry Potter, his arch nemesis. The question of whether it would have been better if Neville had killed Bellatrix sparks various perspectives. Initially, Neville taking revenge on Bellatrix would have been satisfying in the context of war. However, it wouldn't align with Neville's character, showing that he was never about that kind of revenge. The twist of Neville killing Nagini instead is appreciated, as it signifies his liberation from his parents' shadows. This development is seen as a powerful arc, showcasing Neville surpassing his father's legacy. The idea that Neville, marked by Voldemort, could have potentially ended him too is suggested, leading to speculation about the prophecy involving both Harry and Neville. There is symbolism with the Gryffindor sword, presenting itself to any true Gryffindor in their time of need. Neville's use of the sword, particularly without the need for a wand, is considered a fitting and unique arc. Could Neville, despite being a high school student, realistically defeat Bellatrix? The argument considers the simplicity of spellcasting and the potential advantage Neville may not have with focused, one-on-one, -on -one, dueling practice. But there will be consequences of killing and the psychological impact on Neville given his age and character development. I appreciate J.K. Rowling's choice to have Voldemort's killing curse rebound, preserving Harry's pure soul. The contrast is drawn with characters like Molly, who, as a parent, is portrayed as more capable of handling the weight of taking a life. I hope you enjoyed this new video, and if you do, consider watching another article on the channel page. You will be able to know the Wizarding World a bit deeper while helping the channel develop. Knox.